A few weeks ago, Square Enix invited me to a preview event to be one of the first people to play the upcoming action RPG, Final Fantasy XVI. This is a game that I've wanted to try for myself ever since the announcement trailer, so I could find out firsthand if the medieval fantasy setting and the fully real-time action combat system was a good choice for this entry. So in this video, I'll be sharing my impressions based on my time with the game. I'll also be sharing some new gameplay that Square Enix provided me with, along with some updated information based on what was shown to me during a presentation from Final Fantasy XVI's development team. I'll also be recapping some existing information that I feel is relevant to the discussion, but just keep in mind that my impressions and a lot of the gameplay I'll be showing you is based on an early build of the game that was modified for the preview, so certain things could be very different once the game releases. For those of you that are learning about this game for the first time, Final Fantasy XVI is the latest numbered entry in the long run in Final Fantasy series, releasing on the PlayStation 5 on June 22, 2023. Before my hands-on session, I first attended a 45-minute presentation, where the game's producer Naoki Yoshida took to the stage, with live translations from the localization director Michael Christopher Koji Fox. They went over their vision for Final Fantasy XVI in detail, which included some new unreleased gameplay footage, showcasing some of the environments in the world and a better look at the icon versus icon battles. During the presentation, they made a point to mention that even though the mainline Final Fantasy titles are numbered, each numbered title is unique and has their own stories, battle systems, characters and worlds, so newcomers can still play 16 without needing to play through the previous games in the series. And based on what I've played of Final Fantasy 16, I have no doubt that this will be a game that appeals to a wider audience. The portion of the game that I played was a fairly linear story focused section, which was said to take place roughly 5 hours into the game. At first I played for a small tutorial that put me in control of the protagonist Clive, while he was still a teenager training his swordsmanship. This was then followed by a story section, where an older Clive is searching for a person that appears to have been kidnapped, which eventually led to a confrontation with Benedicta and Garuda. During my play session, I had enough time to experience how the main story flowed, and I got a taste of the different aspects of the combat system. But the abilities that I had access to were unlocked a lot earlier than they usually would be, which gave me a lot more to work with during combat. So just keep in mind that you may not be able to do the same things this early in the game once you have a chance to try for yourselves. During the presentation, it was mentioned that Final Fantasy XVI is being developed with a focus on four main pillars. I'll be breaking down each of these pillars so by the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding of the direction this game is taking. The first pillar mentioned was narrative. They said that for Final Fantasy XVI, we want to go back to the rich, high fantasy roots of the series. One thing that was important was to tell a story that was complete from beginning to end, and in that, we think we have succeeded. To facilitate this, there are over 11 hours of cinematic cutscenes alone, all seamlessly interwoven into the game experience, playing in-engine in real time. The realm of Valisthea is where the story of Final Fantasy XVI takes place. Large crystals known as Mother Crystals can be found in various locations throughout the land, and are said to be wellsprings of life and prosperity that bless the land with ether. This ether lets people conjure magic through the use of crystals, which helps them live their lives comfortably. However, there are individuals known as bearers that are born with the ability to manipulate the world's ether directly, letting them use magic without the use of these crystals. But despite what may seem to be a blessing, these people are often shunned by the world and face persecution for their abilities. For generations, people have flocked to the Mother Crystals to take advantage of their blessings, and nations have formed around them. But the threat of the Blight spreads across the realm, shrouding affected areas in darkness and draining its ether, creating lifeless lands where vegetation cannot grow. The ether contained within the realm's crystals is beginning to dry up, and the presence of the Blight is creating additional tension between the nations, which has resulted in some nations attempting to invade others in order to take control of their mother crystals. However, there are powerful beings within the world that help keep a balance between the nations, the Icons. Icons are said to be the most powerful and deadliest creatures in all of Valisthea, and are said to be akin to weapons of mass destruction. These icons reside within a dominant, a man or woman who is blessed with the ability to call upon the icon's power. Those who are born as bearers or dominants cannot escape their fate, however cruel it may be, since the cost that comes with having such great power is that constant use of their abilities will slowly petrify their bodies, eventually turning them to stone. 
In a previous interview, it was mentioned that unlike previous Final Fantasy games, for Final Fantasy XVI, the development team decided to go for a mature age rating in each region. They mentioned that over the years, game ratings have become more restrictive, and even though it's important to make sure that younger players are shielded from extreme material, they didn't want to have to make any edits that could cheapen the experience in order to reach a lower age rating. They pointed out that this wasn't simply because they wanted to make the game more violent or explicit, but because they felt it was necessary to allow them to explore the mature themes that the story tackles. The second pillar of Final Fantasy XVI is the characters. They said that each character is unique in their backgrounds and motivations, and each character has their own unique arcs that play out throughout the story. And while the main focus of this story is on Clive Rosefield as he seeks vengeance for the loss of his family and nation, through his journey players will witness the fates of many other characters as well. The story follows Clive Rosefield through three distinct stages of his life, his teens, his twenties, and his thirties. So while playing through the story, we'll get a detailed picture of how Clive reacts, changes, and grows based on the challenges he faces throughout his life. Clive is the firstborn son of the Archduke of Rosaria. He was expected to inherit the Phoenix's flames and awaken as its dominant, but that role fell to his frail and sickly younger brother Joshua. Clive then decides to dedicate himself to swordsmanship, and at the age of 15 he is dubbed the first shield of Rosaria and is tasked with protecting his younger brother Joshua. Joshua Rosfield is the second son of the Archduke of Rosaria and Clive's younger brother by five years. Joshua awoke as the dominant of the Phoenix soon after his birth and deeply admires his older brother Clive, often lamenting that it was he that was granted command of the Phoenix and not his stronger, braver brother. Joshua grants Clive the blessing of the Phoenix, which lets Clive use several of the Phoenix's iconic abilities. But both Clive and Joshua's peaceful days come to an end, when they're both swept up in tragic events that set Clive down a dangerous path of revenge, in order to seek vengeance for the loss of his family and nation. Jill Warwick was born in the fallen northern territories and was entrusted to Rosaria at a young age as a token of peace. The Archduke insisted that she be raised alongside his sons, Clive and Joshua, eventually becoming a longtime friend to them both, but the tragedy of Rosaria ends up tearing them apart. During this time apart, the icon of ice, Shiva, awakens within her, and after reuniting with Clive, she becomes his closest companion and accompanies him on his difficult journey to find the truth. Sidolphus Telamon is another character that joins Clive on his journey, and he opens Clive's eyes to the real world. Sid is a dominant that controls the power of Ramu, the icon of thunder, but he's also a man of science and the leader of a group that strives to build a place where persecuted bearers and exploited dominants can die on their own terms. Hugo Kupka was once a nameless foot soldier in the Republican army, but after awakening as the dominant of Titan, the icon of Earth, he was thrust into the forefront of Dalmechian politics. He now has the title of Permanent Economic Advisor for the Dalmechian Republic, and he uses this position to exert influence over the nation's armies and its policy making. Benedicta Harmon has a dark past and connections to both Hugo and Sid. She is a cold-hearted and ruthless spy, but she's also the dominant of Garuda, Icon of Wind. Even though each nation usually only has one dominant on their side, she currently serves the Kingdom of Walud alongside Barnabas Tharm, the dominant of Odin. Dion Lesage is the crown prince of the Holy Empire of Sambrek. He is the dominant of Bahamut, King of Dragons and Icon of Light, and also the Lord Commander of the Imperial Army's noblest and most feared Order of Knights, the Dragoons. And Barnabas Tharm is Walud's king and dominant of Odin, Icon of Darkness. Barnabas and Walud are shrouded in mystery as they work behind the scenes, but it was Barnabas that single-handedly conquered the warring tribes of Ash, bringing the entire eastern continent under Walud's control. Even though the story of Final Fantasy XVI has been told from the perspective of Clive Rosefield, the story seems to revolve around the dominance. It's been said that the story will deeply explore the backstories of each of the dominants who carry these icons, and we'll find out what drives them and what their aspirations and desires are, and how their respective nations treat them. The third pillar that they mentioned during the presentation was visuals. They said our development team has put a focus on graphical quality. We wanted to take full advantage of the PlayStation 5's power to create a massively detailed world that was only possible in a video game. 
They mentioned that Final Fantasy 16 is not going to be an open world game because they didn't want to be limited to a single open world space. Instead, they aim to bring players a wide variety of environments in as high quality as possible, which according to them would ultimately enhance the experience for players. They selected several areas that they wanted to focus on and created those in extreme detail, which they've said has resulted in a world that is very large and with lots of places to explore. The realm of Valisthea is divided into two main landmasses, Storm in the west and Ash in the east. And these two landmasses contain five nations and one neutral state. And they are the Grand Duchy of Rosaria, the Holy Empire of Sambrek, the Kingdom of Walud, the Dalmechian Republic, the Iron Kingdom, and the Crystalline Dominion. Clive will be traveling to various locations within the world while he's on his journey. In an interview, it was mentioned that since the game follows Clive throughout the various years of his life, there will be side quests available that will help you learn about what else has been happening within the world. There will also be in-game compendiums and a lot of things to read for people that wish to delve deeper into the world's lore. The fourth and final pillar that they mentioned was battle, and they said over recent years real-time action games have continued their march to becoming the norm amongst gamers. To keep in step and further evolve the Final Fantasy series, Final Fantasy XVI has abandoned the traditional command-based battle system more common in the older games and adopted a true real-time action control. In addition to smaller scale battles, the shining point of Final Fantasy XVI's battle system are the Summon vs Summon battles, which allow players to control giant beings known as icons to carry out battles on a massive scale. Originally, the development team for Final Fantasy XVI had little experience creating action games, so they brought on Ryota Suzuki, who is a veteran in the action game space best known for his contributions to Devil May Cry 5 and Dragon's Dogma. He helped bring together the team's existing combat design ideas and build upon their foundation using his years of experience to create what we have today. The combat system in Final Fantasy XVI revolves around mixing Clive's swordsmanship with the iconic abilities obtained from other dominants he meets on his journey. Pressing square uses Clive's basic melee attack with his sword, and this can be repeated up to four times to form a combo. This can also be performed in mid-air up to three times in order to perform Clive's aerial attack. If Clive and the enemy attack at the same time, Clive will parry the enemy and slow them down briefly so he can perform a counter-attack. Clive can also use magic when pressing triangle to attack enemies at range. Using magic doesn't have an MP cost in Final Fantasy XVI, so it can be fired rapidly even while Clive is moving. And it can also be worked into combos when the appropriate abilities have been unlocked. Pressing R1 will let Clive evade in order to avoid taking damage from attacks. If you evade with perfect timing, Clive will perform a precision dodge, which slows down the enemy briefly and allows for a melee or magic-based counter-attack. One of the main components of the combat system is the stagger system. When attacking stronger enemies and bosses, their yellow will gauge below their health bar will gradually deplete. Once it's fully depleted, the enemy will become staggered and they will be vulnerable until their will gauge recovers. When hitting the enemy while they're staggered, the damage multiplier gradually increases with each strike up to a maximum of 150%. So you'll need to pile on the hits in order to deal as much damage as possible before they can recover. The total damage dealt to them while they're in this state is displayed once their will has recovered. The melee-based combat felt impactful and responsive, and even though magic could be used to extend combos or attack enemies at range, it did feel pretty basic when used on its own. I assume the limited focus on long-range magic is intentional since this combat system encourages fighting enemies at close range. And even if the individual attacks from magic didn't seem to do much damage on their own, Clive's iconic abilities are where most of his power will come from. As the game progresses, Clive can learn new abilities from the icons he encounters. These can be used alongside his default abilities to string together a wide variety of combos. Clive can equip up to three icons at a time, and two iconic abilities can be selected for each icon he has equipped. New abilities can be purchased and upgraded using ability points that are obtained after battles, and each offensive ability has two damage values that influence how much health or will damage it can do. This is indicated by the stars shown in the abilities preview window. Spent ability points can be refunded at any time, so people are free to experiment with different builds as often as they like. But if you want things to be a bit easier, it's possible to use an option that auto-acquires recommended abilities. 
Iconic abilities go into a cooldown after use, but since the cooldown times were fast, it was easy to work them into combos without it feeling like I was out of options. The icons that I had access to while playing were Phoenix, which could instantly teleport to enemies, Garuda, which had a focus on high speed and mid-air attacks, and Titan, which had a focus on chargeable burst damage and timing-based counter-attacks. I could quickly cycle through the icons that Clive had channeled by tapping L2, and I could also hold R2 and press either square or triangle to use iconic abilities. The type of attacks that were performed when using iconic abilities are based on the selected icon. Phoenix has abilities like Rising Flames, which summons a fiery wing that deals damage and can launch enemies into the air, or Heat Wave that summons a wall of liquid flame that dispels projectiles before launching several deadly shockwaves towards the target. Garuda has high-speed aerial focus moves like Gouge, which summons twin claws that relentlessly tear at a target, or Wicked Wheel, which performs a rising attack which strikes all enemies within range and lifts them off the ground. Both Gouge and Wicked Wheel can be used in mid-air to continue a combo. And Titan has chargeable abilities that seem to have a sweet spot for increased potency, like Upheaval, which slams a fist into the ground dealing damage to all enemies in range, with the range increased depending on how long the attack is charged for, or Raging Fists, which causes Clive to step forward and deliver a flurry of high-speed punches that increase in potency if the enemy hits Clive just as he steps forward, resulting in a perfect block counter. Each icon has their own iconic feat that can be used by pressing circle. Iconic feats seem to be a unique situational ability that can be used without a cooldown. Phoenix's iconic feat is called Phoenix Shift, which teleports Clive towards the target. Both melee and magic can be used during the shift to add an additional attack once Clive gets close to the target. Garuda's iconic feat is called Deadly Embrace, which grapples and pulls enemies towards Clive, both on the ground or in mid-air. If you try to use Deadly Embrace on an enemy that's heavier than Clive, the grapple will launch Clive towards the enemy and into the air so he can perform aerial attacks. And Titan's iconic feat is called Titanic Block. This can be used to guard against enemy attacks, but if you perfectly time your block, it's possible to counter-attack with three additional punches. It's also possible for Clive to perform a limit break by pressing L3 and R3 together when Clive's limit break gauge is at least one section filled. Entering limit break puts Clive into a semi-prime state that strengthens his attacks, increases his defense, and gives him automatic health regen, along with a few other enhancements. Using his limit break is recommended when the enemy's will is broken and they're staggered, or if you need to recover Clive's health. While fighting against bosses, there were certain moments where the fight would transition into a cinematic scene. During these scenes, there were still times where I had to take action in order to avoid taking damage, continue attacking the enemy, or even clash with the enemy to push them back. This usually happened when the fight was transitioning into the next phase, or when the characters were having mid-combat banter. Final Fantasy XVI's producer acknowledges that every existing fan will have their own favorite game in the series and feel differently about the various battle systems. But he mentioned that there are also plenty of younger players that may assume that Final Fantasy wouldn't appeal to them because it's an older series. So it seems like with Final Fantasy XVI, they want to bring together the old and the new with updated combat and gameplay systems while bringing back the classic fantasy feel with its world and story. They also mentioned that they understand that the switch to real-time action coming from command-based can be overwhelming and intimidating for players that are not used to real-time action games, or players who simply want to focus more on the story rather than the action. So they worked on a way to make the game more accessible to those fans as well, and created two separate modes. For players who are comfortable with playing action games, they have an action focus mode. And for those who wish to focus on the story, they have a story focus mode. But they made it clear that Final Fantasy XVI doesn't have any difficulty settings. Instead, it has a set of accessories, of which two can be equipped at a time, that make certain aspects of the game easier or more accessible, such as dodging incoming attacks automatically or simplifying complex combos down to a single button press. Selecting Story Focus Mode equips these items from the start, whereas selecting Action Focus Mode will have them unequipped from the start, and based on what they said during the presentation, that's the only difference. There are five of these rings that players can use to customize their own difficulty if they need to. For example, the Ring of Timely Focus slows down time right before an incoming attack lands, prompting the player to press R1 so Clive can stylishly dodge at the last second. 
Accessories like this make the game more accessible without taking away all of the fun, maintaining the feeling that the player is actually playing and what they're doing matters, rather than everything just being automated. During battles we will only be able to directly control Clive, but he won't be fighting alone. Sometimes he will also be assisted by other characters that join him on his journey when their paths cross. These characters have a major role to play within the story and will come and go depending on what's happening. During the presentation, the development team mentioned that because they want players to focus on real-time action, Clive's party members will be fully AI controlled, but they also said that there's going to be a lot of chatter between the party members throughout the game. So they're not just there fighting, they're also communicating with Clive in battle and outside of battle as well. They also went into detail about their companion system, stating that even though other party members are often only temporarily with Clive and are fully AI controlled, Clive's wolf Torgal is almost always with him regardless of who else is there. You can use the D-pad to give Torgal simple commands that affect how he fights in battles, like chaining combos with Clive or providing Clive with basic healing. For players who think controlling two characters might be overwhelming, they also have a timely accessory that automates all of Torgal's commands so that you don't have to worry about it. Torgal can also be used to point you in the right direction when using his animal instincts by pressing L3 outside of battles. And during the presentation, they made a point of letting us know that you can pet Torgal if you really want to. Having non-playable party members isn't necessarily a bad thing depending on how much variety the playable character can provide. While playing the game it didn't feel like I was missing out on much since everything was so fast paced and action packed, but I think while playing the full game I'll miss the strategy and playstyle options which can come from having additional customizable party members. If you're someone that doesn't like Clive's playstyle or his appearance, in this Final Fantasy you're stuck with him. It's not something that bothers me personally, but I can definitely understand why it would be a concern for other people. So hopefully everything else about Final Fantasy 16 is compelling enough to win over the people that enjoyed the character and party options available in some of the previous entries. In terms of action game standards, based on what I've played it is a high quality experience with stylish combos and combat options which seem to offer a lot of depth. But the fights that seem like they'll put your skills to the real test are the bosses. And based on what I've seen, it seems like these fights will have some of the most action-packed and over-the-top moments in the game. The dominant and icon fights in Final Fantasy XVI come in various forms. These can range from Clive fighting against the Dominant in their semi-prime form, where they have access to their iconic abilities while still having a humanoid appearance. There are also fights against Dominance after they've transformed into their Icon, and fights where Clive transforms into an Icon and goes head to head with another Icon in a massive battle. In the semi-primed fights, it seems like you'll need to figure out the fighting style of your opponent based on their Icon's traits. For example, Benedicta can use the power of Garuda to fly around the environment and cast wind-based magic, while also being able to materialize certain parts of Garuda's body, like its talons, to use in her own attacks. As this fight progressed, Benedict's attacks became more dramatic and covered the larger area, like summoning a tornado that could lift Clive off the ground before trapping him with rocks in mid-air and slamming him down to the ground, or ripping off parts of the castle wall to use projectiles. Out of the four bosses that I faced, it felt like this one required my attention the most since there were a lot of attacks that I needed to block or evade. But it was fairly easy to stagger her with the abilities I had access to, so there were plenty of opportunities to deal big damage. But just as I mentioned earlier, players will have access to fewer abilities than I did at this point in the game of release, so the fight may play out completely different. The boss battle where Clive goes head to head with Garuda took place on a fairly small platform, so it was pretty easy to get hit by her attacks that covered a large area. But it was also pretty easy to hit her due to her large size. But despite her size, it was still possible to perfectly block and counter when channeling Titan. If you reduce a larger enemy's will to 50%, they'll get slightly knocked off balance. If you use Garuda's deadly embrace to grapple them within this small window of time, you can topple them and drag them to the ground, opening them up to some free hits while they're trying to stabilize themselves. This fight also had some phases where the majority of the battle area was covered with hazards, so I had to find safe areas on the platform that would let me avoid Garuda's tornadoes. And finally, the last type of dominant battle were the Icon vs Icon battles. These were all described as unique original experiences created from the ground up to be specific to each battle. 
the look and feel of each icon battle will be completely different and based on some of the small clips of the other icon battles that were shown during the presentation, this seems to be true. For example, the Ifrit vs Garuda fight is a very heavy and impactful battle that was compared to a pro wrestling match by the development team. There was one point in the fight where they just both end up trading blows while ripping each other's arms and legs off. This battle was the most straightforward out of all of the boss battles I did, but it was also the least forgiving, since in this battle there was no potion usage or assistance from companions. You just had to take very deliberate actions against Garuda so you didn't get caught in her attacks. Once I figured out what to do, it wasn't too difficult to take her down, but it wasn't the type of fight where you could just rush in without paying attention to what she was doing. The Garuda fight was intense, but it did feel like I spent more time watching the last third of the fight rather than actively taking part in it. It was still entertaining to watch and to follow up with the inputs when I was required to, so I have no doubt that the battles involving large enemies, whether that be Clive fighting against an icon or two icons fighting each other, are going to be some of the most memorable moments of the game. After defeating enemies, they can drop loot, which is collected automatically by getting close to where they dropped. But after major battles, loot is presented in a menu on screen, so you can clearly see your rewards like experience and ability points gained, gil earned, and the items obtained. These item rewards seem to range from crafting materials of varying rarities to bits of equipment that can be used to customize Clive. I haven't seen much info about the crafting system in the game, but it was mentioned during the presentation that they'll be going into more details about Final Fantasy XVI's RPG system soon. In terms of equipment, Clive can equip a weapon, a belt, a van brace, and he has three slots for accessories. Apart from the timely accessories that I mentioned earlier, the other accessories that I saw seem to have various enhancements which could be used to boost Clive's stats or improve the performance of specific abilities. It's been a very long time since I've had this much excitement for a Final Fantasy game. During my day with Final Fantasy XVI, my attitude towards the game went from curiosity and general interest to genuine excitement by the time I was done. I just sat there with a huge smile on my face while watching bits of the presentation and while playing through certain parts of the demo. It was announced that they were eventually planning to release a demo for everyone to try, but I'm not sure if it will contain the same content as this one. And it was also announced that at release, there will be graphical and performance modes available for Final Fantasy XVI. So even though this demo was in 30fps due to the game still undergoing optimization, at release people can select the visual options that work best for them. I'm planning to make some more videos for Final Fantasy XVI and other action RPGs like Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, so keep an eye out for those. But until I make those videos, here's another one that you might find interesting.